entitled today's sermon, Do I Have Free Will or Not? Like I told you last week, we could skip from chapter 8 and go right to chapter 12 and miss 9, 10, and 11. We could say we wouldn't miss nothing. Because it, chapter 8 goes right into 12 on the same subject matter. When this happens, it begs the question, why is it here? What does God want me to see? What is God trying to tell me? Chapter 9 starts out by telling us that to the people of Israel belongs the adoption of sons, as sons, the glory of the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and it is from them, the chosen people, that Jesus Christ descends from, who is God over all. As I studied this chapter, and we have to remember chapter 9 is about Israel in the past. So where do we find about the Israelites in the past? <coughs> in the Old Testament. <coughs> there was this thing that kept coming back to me. If God could reject His chosen people, what was there to keep Him from rejecting me? I don't believe I have any blood in me of Abraham or of Isaac. So I would be considered a Gentile. What is it to say that God hasn't already rejected me? What is keeping him from rejecting me? Seventeen, verse 17 says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may demonstrate my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So could there, this mean that there are those who are chosen for destruction so that God can show His power and might to the world. They have no choice. No matter how they live or what they do, this is their destiny. Has God chosen people like that? There are some who will go against God and they don't have a choice. It's already been decided for them. I had to think of Judas. The one that betrayed Jesus. The one that said, this is the one that is the one guy you want. This is the one that you're going to condemn to go to the cross. The idea that he was one of the twelve, but then they turned Jesus over to the chief, chief of priests, the chief priests, in the middle of the night. Was Judas chosen for this moment, and he didn't have a choice in the matter? Luke 22, verse 22, For the Son of God is to go just as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. The Jews have a choice. Jesus chose him to be one of the twelve. It was predetermined 
that Jesus will be betrayed and crucified. We know this. That's why God sent him. We're told that's why he came. At one point, Jesus says that it would have been better for the one who betrays him if he hadn't been born. It would seem as though Judas didn't have the choice that he was condemned before he was born. <laughs> he was part of the plan of salvation through Jesus Christ on his death on the cross for our sins. But, Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5. Now when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus had been condemned, he regretted what he had done, returned the thirty silver coins to the chief priests, and the others saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is, it that, what is that to us? You take care of it yourself. So Judas threw the silver coins in the temple and left. And he went out and hung himself. When I read this part, I always have to think, why did Judas go out and hang himself? He was remorseful for what he'd done. Did he have a choice? Couldn't he stop himself? Didn't know he was condemned? Whether he was remorseful or not? Doesn't Scripture teach us, repent and you will be saved? Do you think Judas didn't believe Jesus Christ? That Jesus was the Son of God? We're also told that if we believe on Him, we will be saved. So why did He go out and hang Himself? This would tell me that Judas didn't realize his mistake in betraying Jesus. He was remorseful. But why commit suicide? He had no choice. He was just an instrument in the plan of salvation. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God told Moses this after the people worshipped the golden calf, and God was deciding what to do with these people. For having built this other God and worshipping it, worshipping an idol. Moses wanted God to show him his glory, and God put Moses into the rock and passed by. Moses was told, you can't see my face. No human being can see my face or they will die. God put Moses in a rock, put his hand over him as he passed by. Moses could see his back, but not his face. God told Moses to get up and go into the land I promised, but I am not going with you. Because I may destroy you on the way. These were God's chosen people. Did he bring them out of Egypt just to destroy them? Was this his plan all along? It would show him show his glory, how powerful mighty he was. All the world would know this. There seems to be another element involved. I will have mercy and I will have compassion. I checked a couple different versions. And they all say I will have mercy, I will have compassion. But I did some digging and it could be put in there I may have mercy. They could change the I will to I may. 
I may have compassion. God was thinking about it. God made the decision, said, I'm not going with you people. Now go into the land I told you, but I'm not going with you because I may kill you. I may destroy you. These were his chosen people. But something happened to make him think about changing his mind. At this point, God had not decided on how he would punish them. Being that sin requires punishment. Disobedience requires puni punishment. But God, I mean, Moses wanted God to spare the people. So God said, oh, think about it. I may have mercy on you. This again would seem as though Pharaoh, wait a minute, back up, for uh, 9, verse 17 also says, for the scripture, Romans 9 and 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may demonstrate my power in you, that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Here again, when talking about Pharaoh, he was put in this place at this time so that God could use him. He was an instrument. He was a pawn in God's plan. When you read and study Exodus about the plagues, you will find that God tells Moses that after each plague, Pharaoh will harden his heart. It is only in the end. When Pharaoh sees that the people actually have gone, that God says, I will harden his heart. And he will come after you. It is then that everyone will see my glory and power. Notice what happened. Verse 17 is a quote from all, uh, Exodus 9, 16. For this purpose I have caused you to stand, to show you my strength, so that my name may be declared in all the earth. This came after the, the plague of hail, the, the seventh plague, where God tells Moses to go and tell Pharaoh, I could have killed you. could have killed you by now. But I have kept you for a purpose of making my name great. Exodus 9.15 For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague and you would have been destroyed from the earth. But God didn't do that. But I have kept you around so that I can show you my power and all my people will know my name. God also says Pharaoh was making himself greater than God, and this is not to be. When we tie this in with Romans 1, where it tells us that even though people knew God, they would not worship him. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped the creation instead of the Creator. So that God gave them over to the desires of the hearts and their depraved minds. What is this telling us? Did God have Pharaoh born into this world just for the purpose of having him used to proclaim his glory and power? This is the same thing with Judas. Was he born just to betray Jesus, to send him to the cross to die?
So then, God has mercy on whom He chooses to have mercy, and He hardens whom He chooses to harden. We could say we have no choice in the matter. We only live in this life that God has given me, that God has designed for me, and that's all there's to it. It is God who chooses who He will have mercy on and whose heart He will harden. Which is, rightly so, since God is talking about He does have that right. He is the one and only God. He is His sovereign God. Meaning He has and He is all powerful. He has all authority. He is king over all. It is his right to do as he chooses. So then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? It's not my fault. It's the way I was made. God chose to do this to me. To make me this way. I just lived my life. I hope I'm one of the chosen ones. Live as good as I can. Do the best I can. That's all it's to it. No responsibility on my part whatsoever. <laughs> I got two of them going back. <laughs> Isn't this what it's saying? Isn't this what Scripture is showing us? He picked Judas. To betray Jesus. He had Pharaoh to show his power and strength. If you notice, Pharaoh hardened his own heart after each play. When he saw things all went away and came back to normal, he hardened his heart and said, no, you guys can't go. <clears throat> Do I have the right to ask the Almighty God why He made me this way? Romans 9.20 gives the answer. How dare you question God? The one who created you. Does the molded pot ask the potter why you have made me this way? The potter does have the right to make one pot for special use and the one for ordinary use. He is the creator. He's a sovereign God. Therefore, he can, he has the right to do what he wants. Therefore, I don't really have the right to ask God, why is it the way it is? I'm to accept it. God is God. Begs the question, if God is such a loving, merciful God, why is there so much evil and ugliness in the world? Well, that's just the way it is. We have to accept it.
Okay, so what do I do with this knowledge? This knowledge that God is all authority, He is the Creator, and demands that His creation worships and honors Him and only Him. Do I have any say in the matter? Must I make a choice or it is already made for me? And I just simply live my life best I can and hope I'm the one of the chosen ones. Remember last week I said about we're all sinners and God has the right to reach down and to pick a few to call his own to make them his children are you one of the chosen am I one of the chosen ones how do we know in the examples given in this chapter the twins of Esau and Jacob. Why was the ones chosen and the other not? So that God's purpose and election would stand, not by works, but by His calling. Is that word calling important? And then favor. I raised you up so that I may demonstrate my power in you. I let you stand would be better wording. God allowed Pharaoh to say no to a point. And then God made Pharaoh say no. The choice was taken out of his hands. At what point? At what point does the choice of us coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and to live in obedience to God and His Word, at what point is the choice taken away from me? God going to say not you how often you say no to Jesus Christ in something that the Holy Spirit has told you to do how often you say no before God says that's it I'm going to say no for you then you don't have a choice In chapter 1, in Romans chapter 1, we are allowed to think for ourselves to a point. And then God will make the choice to allow us to go our own way. It is in this that God's righteousness and His love are shown to all the world. It shows that He is God. He's God over all. We have to keep in mind that we're all born sinners. We have a sin nature. All because of Adam and Eve. Jesus Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. The plan of salvation came into effect while we were sinners, 
Not after we said, I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow God. That plans in, in effect for you to say, I will. I do. This means, since Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, this means that none of us deserve mercy and grace from God. Did you ever consider that? It's been more than once since I became pastor here that I have thought I'm not, I don't deserve this. I'm not the one that should be here. I'm not worthy of being a spokesman for God. But here I am. I made the choice to listen to the Holy Spirit. This then tells me that something must happen on our part. There must be a human response to the calling of God. When God calls, we as humans must make a response. Scripture tells us that no one can come to Jesus Christ unless the Father calls them. Meaning God is in the calling business. He's all powerful. He's got all authority. He chooses who He chooses. But God is in the calling business. It also says no one can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Has God already decided who's going to be saved or not? Do we have a choice? Do I have a choice? Romans 10 13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's in the next chapter. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Does that look like we don't have a choice? We don't see the whole picture. Scripture tells us, and I talked about this last week, Scripture tells us things have been decided for us. Predestination, the chosen. But Scripture also says that we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. It is through Jesus Christ that we come to God. We have to decide to believe in Him. We have to decide to obey Him. Scripture teaches both. Which one do we believe? It's important. We believe both. They're in the Bible. They're taught in the Scriptures. In God's Word. It's important. It's not 60-40, 75-25, it's 50-50. It's equal, 100%. I shouldn't say 50-50. 100% this one, 100% this one. It has to be that way. Do we understand it? Do I understand it? Will I be able to explain it to you? Probably not, because I don't understand it. 
But I think this is what chapters 9, 10, and 11 are all about. To help us to see the all powerful God. To help us to understand what is respected of, expected of us in this walk in this world. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the question is, is it all planned out for us? And no need for us to consider anything? Or is there a response needed from us? Do I have free will? Or is it all God's will? Maybe it's both. I have the free will to choose God's will. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your scriptures. For the Holy Bible that you have laid out for us to read, to study, to meditate on. And for sending the Holy Spirit so that we can understand the scriptures. is when you have delivered the Holy Spirit to us that we can start to understand your word, to comprehend how to obey you. We come to this understanding what it is you want from us, what your will is. Heavenly Father, help us to Pick up that Bible daily. To study your word daily. To read it. And then Heavenly Father, have the Holy Spirit interpret it for us so that we can understand it. I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Walk a bit.